Hi. Hello again. In our previous video called Where is Jehovah? We were reflecting on the contrast between the Watchtower's insistence that God is locatable, he's somewhere in the universe. They used to say the constellation of Pleiades. They backed off that, but they still have a God who is limited in space and time. Mm -hmm. So we ended up in Psalm 139, which we'll take up again in greater detail now. Psalm 39, where David gives his point of view on where Jehovah is. Mm -hmm. We did reflect on the first eight verses last time. We'll review those right now. Maybe read verses 1 and 2 and 7 and 8. Okay. O Jehovah, you have searched through me, and you know me. You yourself have come to know my sitting down and my rising up. You have considered my thought from afar off. 7 and 8. Where can I go from your spirit? And where can I run away from your face? If I should ascend to heaven, there you would be. And if I should spread out my couch in Sheol, look, you would be there. Literally, you there. Mm -hmm. In the ESV it says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence, not face? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Sheol being not just the grave, although some Jews did believe that, but also being the place of departed spirits, according to most uh, of the Jewish teachers and rabbis of the New Testament period, that was what Sheol was. Mm -hmm. Although in some parts of the Bible it seems to have other overtones, grave for instance. However, it's a, it's a way of saying God is everywhere. God is in heaven, God's on earth, and God's even in that other place where the spirits go. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that the Watchtower Bible has given the word face there. It certainly connotes his personal presence with David. Right. So our takeaway from this, it seems to me, should be answering the question, where is Jehovah? Jehovah is everywhere. David's personal experience had led him to that conclusion. He had the sense as he looked back on his life that Jehovah was present with him all the time. Mm -hmm. Interesting that he links the personal presence with the face of Jehovah, as indeed the book of Ezekiel does later. We won't deal with that now, but when when God finally solves the problem of the nations and his people, Israel, it makes the point that at Jehovah's face or presence, the mountains shake and all walls fall. So I don't doubt we'll get into that at a later date, but it connotes God's <clears throat> presence on earth. And if this is David's conviction, why don't Jehovah's Witnesses believe that God is omnipresent? Mm. And why don't don't they believe that God's spirit is is God? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I Christendom does, of course, yeah. and so they believe in God's omnipresence. It's the factor of reasoning for witnesses. They they can't they can't explain it, so they don't want to believe something they can't explain. Whereas you get the attitude of David in verse six: "Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high up that I cannot attain to it." Yeah. He doesn't seem to mind the fact that he he can't explain God. <laughs> he has the humility to realize that God is beyond our imagination, beyond our explanations. Yet he has the sense from his experience again that God has always been present with him personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why don't we read the rest of this marvelous psalm and see what our takeaway will be. Okay. Psalm 139 from 9 to 24. Were I to take the wings of the dawn, that I might reside in the most remote sea, there also your own hand would lead me, and your right hand would lay hold of me. And were I to say, surely darkness itself will hastily seize me, then night would be light about me, even the darkness itself would not prove too dark for you. But night itself would shine just as the day does. The darkness might just as well be the light. For you yourself produced my kidneys. You kept me screened off in the belly of my mother. I shall laud you, because in a fear-inspiring way I am wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, as my soul is very well aware. 
My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was woven in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw even the embryo of me, and in your book all its parts were down in writing. As regards the days when they were formed, and there was not yet one among them. So to me, how precious your thoughts are. O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. If I try to count them, they outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. O oh God, if only you would slay the wicked, then the violent men would depart from me. Those who say things against you with evil intent, they are your adversaries who take up your name in a worthless way. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Jehovah, and loathe those who revolt against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. They have become real enemies to me. Search through me, O God, and know my heart. Examine me and know my anxious thoughts. See whether there is in me any harmful way and lead me in the way of eternity. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness, what, what is your takeaway? Uh, yeah. Well, as a Jehovah's Witness, the verses that that now are painfully uh, a painful memory for me is is the verse uh, 20 and 21 about uh, hating his enemies. Uh, Do I not hate those who inten- are intensely hating you, O Jehovah? Because um, I remember when we were disfellowshipped, when I tried to fool my father, and I asked him, do you hate me? Because the watchtower said, you are to hate apo- you know, apostates. And they considered me an apostate. So I said, do you hate me? And my dad kind of faltered and said he loved me. But he said it in past tense as far as I could see. So you do hate me. You know, like, <laughs> it was not a nice memory. So it is ironic that the Watchtower should use this text to justify shunning. Mm-hmm. That's the way you love people is by hating them. That is by yeah. you hate. They have proven that they hate Jehovah so that you love them by shunning them. But yeah. is there anything about shunning here? Well, no. David is actually praying that God judges his enemies. Mm-hmm. Yes, he hates them. He, he re- regards them as his enemies, but what's the higher morality of the New Testament that says love your enemies as well? Yeah. David's not there yet. He's not a New Testament saint, that's for sure. He hates Jehovah's enemies, but, but look in verse 20 as to why he hates them. These are people who, in verse 19, are violent men, men of blood, it literally says. Those who say evil things against you, the people yeah. who are apostates against God, not against, yeah. not disagreeing with David, who speak hate against God. God yeah. And they take up your name in a worthless way. It's ironic that now we look back on our life in the Washington and we think, no, we were using the name of God in a worthless way. And we didn't think of ourselves as, as, doing, that. as doing that at yeah. all. That's true. But what, yeah, what yeah. should be our takeaway here? I mean, the overall picture in this passage, you know, he's, he's kind of thinking how wonderful God is. Why can't he get rid of my enemies? I mean, that seems to be the way he's reasoning on this. Yeah. That's the only reason the enemies come in here. Right. It's because he can't quite fit it with the fact that God is everywhere and with him always. So he's on the run and God is with him. Yeah. He spent years of his life on the run from his enemies. Although mm-hmm. he took on his pagan enemies militarily sometimes. Mm-hmm. He found friendship, friendship among his pagan enemies too, and a, a refuge from his Jewish or his Israelite yeah. enemies. He, he can contrast his God with the pagan gods who are localized. And and his chief enemy, of course, was the king of Israel himself, Saul. Mm-hmm. He never took action against him, despite the fact that he hates those who hate God. He doesn't take action against his chief enemy. Mm-hmm. So in this context, though, you see it again, David's humility at the end. It's not, his last thought isn't destroy them. It's search through me, O God, and know my heart. Examine me and know my anxious thoughts. See whether there is any harmful way in me and lead me in the way of eternity. As you said before about verse 6, his mm-hmm. humility shines through. Yeah. I also thought back in verse 9, too, he links again the presence of God with with the aid that comes to him. 
his deliverances from his enemies. Mm -hmm. He links that to the right hand of God on his yeah. behalf. So he's, he's talking in very uh, physical terms. He's talking like we talk when we are, are speaking about things. We, we have to use whatever is readily understandable to us. It's like when you're talking to children, you use something that they can get. These, so, are, these are usually termed anthropological metaphors, right? God's right. face, God's hand, yeah. God's arm. But you don't get the impression that he thinks of God's hand or, or arm in here. He's, he, he, he's talking about God's presence, his, his, the fact that he's, he knows he's with him always. So even if we take it as a metaphor, God has eyes, God can see everything. God can even see inside me, mm -hmm. David says. but. Is it because he has human eyes? No, he can even see in the dark. But he's he's just not limiting God yeah. to physical uh, human terms. So this mm -hmm. tendency you see very explicitly in Psalm 139, David is not limiting God. He's not limiting God's presence. And if you don't limit God's presence to one space in the universe, you also, by implication, believe in God's omniscience. God knows everything, which he plainly says is the case. Mm -hmm. He knows things about us that we don't know. Yeah. If God knows everything, he's not the God of the watchtower, who yeah. has is dependent and, uh, of course, creates a dependent people. I think that's the thing that jumps out at me from, from this. That why, what's the reason the watchtower has to use two of these verses to defend their shunning policy? They've created a, a God who's dependent on human organization. Yeah, they have to deal with the enemies. They have to deal with the enemies. They can't pray to God that he deal with their enemies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that is a substitute for real faith. As, as Ray Franz points out over and over again in his two books, uh, you have to do big organization if, if your God is small. Mm -hmm. And the God of David is certainly not small. But these thoughts are not original to him, although they are certainly more explicit here than they are elsewhere in the Old Testament or even sometimes in the New Testament. Yeah. They're not original. They're suggested very clearly in the books of Moses. Yeah. So we, we should re return to some of the things we've already talked about in, in the books of Moses, specifically Genesis and Exodus, to see yeah. how, how Moses reasons upon the attributes of God. Yeah, I think we were going to talk a little bit about, you know, this this tendency of, of reducing God to our level. It's not just with the witnesses, because the witnesses do that, but so do other yeah. religions and cults. They're more like the pagans in what they keep. They, they, they try and reduce God to the level of man. Yeah. Big problem with Mormonism. Mm -hmm. yeah, so and with Islam. Yeah, so they can't think of of uh, these phrases without putting them in human terms. So you know, w witnesses they're very human oriented. Uh, you know, they're thinking about a paradise earth without God. They just they're thinking of themselves. Mormons, you know, their their whole thing about making little gods. Uh, they have Jehovah originally having sex in order to have a child mm -hmm. uh, you know we it's impossible for them to think somehow break out of thinking in human terms the reason why uh, Islam is is offended when you use the the term father mm -hmm. is because they can't think of it in anything but a carnal sense yeah even their heaven for for males anyway is a, mm -hmm. is a endless carnal delight yeah Mm -hmm. It's so true. You make God after your own image, and that's why the revelation of the Old Testament, not just the New, is so basic to our understanding of the attributes of God. So next time, let's go back to Moses and see what he thinks about the omnipotence, the omniscience, and the omnipresence of Yahweh. Mm -hmm.